All right, uh, welcome also from my side. My name is Tim Habicht. I'm a senior software engineer here at Navis. Um, this talk will not be about my work here. It's about a project that I started this year. And I want to talk to you about how I um, decided to and how I built my own Game Boy from scratch. So in case you have not been alive in the 90s and you don't know what I'm talking about, <laughs> this is a Game Boy. And uh, let me start with a short history. So Nintendo released the Game Boy on April 21st, 1989 in Japan. And roughly, or more or less exactly 30 years later, the YouTube algorithm in its infinite wisdom um, proposed this talk to me. It's the ultimate Game Boy talk by uh, Michael Steil at the Chaos Communication Congress in 2016. And I watched the whole thing and afterwards thought, hmm, the architecture of a Game Boy doesn't look that difficult. How hard can it be to build one from scratch? So my life goals obviously immediately changed and <laughs> building a Game Boy from scratch became topmost priority. So what is a Game Boy? Um, there have been multiple versions. The first one, like I said, was released in 1989. But there have been follow-ups to that, like the Game Boy Pocket, that uh, has a much better display. Um, it, is, it has a smaller housing, so it's, uh, yeah, it fits in your pocket. And there have been other versions, like the Game Boy Lite. Um, this has an illuminated uh, uh, display, so you can play at night. For some reason, it was only released in Japan. I don't know why. Um, and there's the Game Boy Color. Uh, it has twice the amount of RAM. Uh, double the amount of... All right, perfect, thank you. Um, okay, so over these four devices, uh, in total, around 200 million Game Boys have been sold, and they were actually produced until um, 2003. So a little bit more in detail, what is a Game Boy? It has a custom 8-bit uh, CPU from, made by Sharp that runs at around 4 megahertz. Um, if you look up specs of a Game Boy online, you can sometimes read that it runs at one megahertz. That's not actually true, but um, the, the whole architecture is limited by the speed of the RAM, and you can only access RAM at one megahertz. It has eight kilobytes of RAM and eight kilobytes of video RAM. It has ROM in form of cartridges that are the games, so you, um, and those vary in size from 32 kilobytes to up to two megabytes. It has a display with a resolution of 160 by 144 pixels that runs at roughly 60 hertz. And it can show four shades of gray. If you've ever seen a Game Boy, those are four ugly shades of green. Uh, if you open a Game Boy and look inside it, it looks like this. Um, let me see if that works. Yes, the large chip here in the middle is the CPU. The, um, other two chips that you can see here, those are RAM and video RAM. The CPU itself, um, the architecture is actually quite interesting. It supports uh, most of the instructions of an Intel 8080 CPU, but not all of them. It also supports most of the instructions of the Silox Z80 CPU, which is a strict superset of this Intel CPU, but again, it doesn't support all of them and it has a couple of uh, other features that are neither in the other two um, CPUs. The Game Boy has uh, a register set of um, eight registers of a size of eight bytes. It has two 16, uh, sorry, eight bits. It has two 16-bit registers that are used to store addresses, the stack pointer and the um, program counter. And it has a special register, the uh, flex register that store, um, so if, if you execute an instruction and the result is zero, you would see this in your flag register. Interestingly, you can combine um, two of these registers uh, to actually store 16-bit values, and you can use this to calculate addresses, because the Game Boy has a 16-bit address bus. The architecture of a Game Boy is actually quite well documented. If you look online, you will get um, tables like this uh, that show the 
uh, operational codes of the actual instructions. So Game Boy has, in this case, um, 256 instructions that you can use. And if you run a special instruction called the prefix instruction, you can use another set of 256 instructions. By the way, the numbers of two of these instructions on this table are wrong. I had to learn this the hard way. <laughs> so let's look at one uh, example. This is a load instruction. It loads the, um, the value that is stored at the address BC into register A. The numbers below there um, tell us that this instruction is one byte in size and it takes eight CPU cycles to execute this instruction. Timing is very critical for a Game Boy. Um, I will maybe tell a little bit more about that later. Okay, so I wanted to build my Game Boy from scratch, so I started by writing an emulator in C++. Uh, how, do you run, how do you write an emulator? Basically, you write an endless loop that first checks for interrupts. It loads um, instructions from memory, in this case from ROM. I wrote an instruction decoder that then tells me, okay, which instruction is it, how many operands is it supposed to have, and so on. I execute this instruction, and then you have, again, take, or, take care of timing. Um, so you have to adjust your timer, and PPU in this case is the picture processing unit. So you also have to take care that the pixels are updated on the screen. This is a little bit simplified. Um, in theory, it should work like this. In practice, you have to live with the fact that the Game Boy CPU has some bugs, and you have to re-implement those bugs, and that makes this a little bit harder. <laughs> Let's look uh, how you actually execute an instruction. I decided to write a switch statement, and then I check, okay, uh, opcode is zero. That's a knob. It's a no instruction that basically does nothing, so it don't do anything. Um, if it sees uh, instruction number one, you uh, load the operand into your registers and you continue. And in this case, I only implemented two instructions. So whenever I encounter an instruction that I haven't implemented yet, I print an error message. So the development workflow looks like this. You run your, element, your emulator on a game of your choice. You wait until you get an error message that you did not implement a specific instruction. You implement this instruction and you repeat this cycle for about two weeks. <laughs> so I've shown you that I uh, implemented this as a switch statement. Um, you have to take care that you don't put too much code into one of these cases because uh, it might be that this switch statement becomes longer and longer <laughs> and longer. <laughs> and with about 2,000 lines of code, this is by far the largest switch statement that I've ever written. And I guess it won't pass a code review. <laughs> but I wrote lots of unit tests, um, so this might make the reviewers happy again. So I actually wrote unit tests for basically all the instructions, and I'm a fan of test-driven development, so I wrote my tests first. Um, maybe what's interesting here, I also wrote this unit test uh, in such a way that all of these unit tests can be written out as valid Game Boy ROMs, and you can actually use these Game Boy run, ROMs and run them in different emulators, or if you want to on actual Game Boys, to check whether they pass there, and you can also see what other emulators are doing. All right, so where do you actually start uh, executing your, um, your Game Boy ROM? So the Game Boy has a so-called boot ROM. It's 256 uh, bytes of code and it's directly built into the CPU chip. Um, it took until 2003, I guess, uh, when somebody actually opened uh, the CPU of a Game Boy and looked at it with a microscope at the mask ROM to decode the instructions that are in this boot ROM. But basically what it's doing, it um, displays and scrolls the Nintendo logo stored in the cartridge. It plays the characteristic sound And the boot ROM checks that the logo is displayed correctly. This is actually quite interesting because the game is supposed to um, show the Nintendo logo. The Game Boy only checks that it's displayed. So every game 
has to have a license from Nintendo, otherwise they are not allowed to show this logo, uh, otherwise it would be a trademark violation. So some of the first results that I got uh, from my emulator, if you look closely here, you might be able to see the Nintendo logo, um, uh, somewhat strangely arranged. A uh, couple of hours later, I was for the first time able to boot up Tetris and I could see that it's uh, showing something here and also start Super Mario Land. Um, the colors are a little bit off here because I hadn't implemented um, the correct color palettes that the Game Boy uses. The current status looks like this. My emulator is able to run uh, Super Mario Land and it actually works quite well. There are a couple of glitches because I have not implemented everything that the PPU can actually do. And you might realize that I'm displaying more than the Game Boy display can actually show because the Game Boy internally uh, renders um, 256 by 256 pixels. And I thought it's actually nice to see what it's doing internally because you can see that it's um, pre-computing the world while you're playing it and uh, just scrolls to the right position. So I said I wanted to build my own Game Boy, um, so I didn't stop at writing an emulator. I also want to uh, build my own hardware. Um, in order to do that, I, I bought a Game Boy on eBay. Um, that one is broken because the display is, uh, doesn't uh, work correctly. So I got it for around 20 euros. Um, if you want to buy a Game Boy in good working condition, you have to pay up to 80 euros still. So they're not really cheap. Um, but I had to open it because uh, first of all, I wanted to clean it. And I also want to reverse engineer um, some of the inner workings of the Game Boy. And working with uh, 30 years old hardware is sometimes a challenge. So I had to use power tools to actually open it. Um, I ported my emulator to a microcontroller. You can see that one here. Uh, it is also able to run this emulator right now. It's an ESP32 microcontroller. It's not running in uh, real time yet. That's mainly because uh, my picture processing unit is uh, a little bit slow. I render a new frame every t on every write to memory. That's really nice for debugging, but it's not really efficient. Um, here you can see it again without a flicker. Um, that's yeah, Super Mario Land running on my microcontroller. Future work, I want to integrate this into an actual Game Boy housing, so I bought uh, one um, a Chinese clone. Um, <laughs> the quality is actually really nice uh, and they're quite cheap. I also bought original games because I uh, want my uh, hardware to also run these games. Uh, Tetris on the right you can buy again very cheap for about one euro because it was shipped with every Game Boy and there are hundreds of millions of copies around. Um, other games like Zelda, they are quite rare, quite expensive, and I think I had to pay like 30 euros for that. So uh, what are my future plans? I want to put my emulator on GitHub. Um, I already created a repository there. Uh, right now it only contains a readme. Um, I promise that I will put the code on there as well within maybe the next, the next week. But I realized, uh, because I wanted to do that before I give this talk, but I realized that I first have to get rid of some of the pri proprietary code. So maybe the, mainly the boot ROM and some other stuff because uh, like I said, my unit tests, they route, write out valid ROMs. So they also write out the Game Boy logo in there and I think I'm not allowed to do that. Um, so once that's fixed, I promise I will put the code uh, in there. So what did I learn? I can now read and write 8080s slash set 80 assembly code. And I'm pretty sure that this superpower will come in handy at some point. <laughs> I learned a lot about CPU architecture, like instruction, decoding, interrupts, timing, and so on. And I blocked YouTube on all my devices to prevent further time-consuming projects. <laughs> so uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak here. And um, thanks for your attention.